Jesus drank the cup of abomination, sin, and filth, and wickedness, and judgment. He drank it to his very last dregs. And today our, our message to the world is no more judgment, no more wrath from God, no more punishment. Jesus finished it all. It's the message for the Benjamin generation. It was found in his sight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God hides world events in the book of Genesis. It's not only the book of beginnings, it's also the book of endings. Amen. I think of all the characters in the Bible, there is no one that typifies Christ in more detail than Joseph. I think David comes a close second. But if you look at the life of Joseph, you find a beautiful picture of the Messiah. He was loved by his father. The father loved him. And the father sent him to seek out the welfare of his brethren. So the father sent the son to seek out the welfare of his Jewish brothers. But his brothers were jealous of him. They rejected him. And they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Our Lord Jesus came unto his own, his Jewish brethren. And they received him not. And they sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Now all this while, Joseph, even after he was sold, his heart longed for his brothers. He longed for his father, Israel. And in all this, I want you to understand one thing. Even though Israel has rejected her Messiah, her Messiah has never rejected Israel. And that's the love of God that God has for you and I. It's a love that is unconditional. And you know something the Bible says? All Israel one day will be saved. We find that in the story of Joseph, right after he was sold, he became the bread of life to the Gentile world. You know, the Egyptians were Gentiles, non-Jews. And for 2,000 years, our Lord Jesus Christ has become the bread of life to the Gentile world. Whereas Israel was suffering in famine, but one of Israel's sons, Joseph, was actually the viceroy of Egypt. It was his wisdom that prospered the Gentile world. So for 2,000 years, Joseph, in fact, he was given the name, the Egyptian name, Zephnap Panea, which means savior of the world. Isn't that interesting? So our Lord Jesus Christ, for 2,000 years of Israel's rejection, has become the bread of life to the Gentile world. And during this time, you know, she was, he was given a bride by the name of Asinaf. She was an Egyptian girl. And uh, because she was a Gentile bride, it tells us that during this time of Israel's rejection of her Messiah, our Lord Jesus, his bride, is made up predominantly of Gentiles. But one day, Israel's eyes will open and see the Messiah. And this is where the story is going. It's a beautiful story, but my, my focus today is not on Joseph. It is on Israel's youngest son, Benjamin. Because I believe... This end time generation will be called the Benjamin generation. Because everything that typifies Benjamin in the story of Genesis is the same qualities, same provisions you'll see happen to this end time generation. Amen. Amen. But first, let's look at the back, backdrop of this entire story. You find in Stephen's sermon, he says that when Joseph first appeared to his brothers, they did not know him. They only knew him at his second appearance. Isn't it like our Lord Jesus? In his first coming to Israel, they did not recognize who he was. But in the second coming, they will all say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 And we are not too far away from that day. Everything is converging upon the Middle East once again. Praise the Lord. The plot thickens. Well, from where you get the authority, Pastor Prince, to say that Joseph is a type of, of our Lord Jesus, and well, we get it from the Apostle Paul, who made typology kosher. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 4. Tell me, the Apostle Paul says, you who desire to be under law. You know, Paul always challenged those who desire to be under law. He tells them, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond woman and the other by a free woman. Name me the one by the bond woman. His name was Ishmael. The one by Sarah, his name was Isaac. 
So I, Ishmael was born of the servant girl, Hagar, whereas Isaac was born of the legal wife, Sarah. Now the Bible tells us that this Hagar, next verse, but he who was of the born woman was born according to the flesh. Now Ishmael was born according to the flesh. That means what? Self-effort. It was Abraham's effort with his slave girl. But he of the free woman through promise. Isaac was born through the barren Sarah. This is totally God. Can I have a good amen? Amen. amen. It's totally grace. Write this down. Grace and promise goes together. Just like law and human effort go together. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible says these two boys, Ishmael and Isaac, Ishmael born of Hagar, Isaac born of Sarah, and these two women are symbolic. There you have it, typology. Amen? The two women are now two covenants. These are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai. Now, don't ask me how Hagar became a mountain. All right, that's typology. I told you just now, God hides even uh, events, world events in the Bible. God hides his richest secrets in characters of the Bible. So the two covenants are the two women. These two women literally existed during the time of Abraham. But God saw them as two covenants. All right, the one uh, from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage is Hagar. Now, Hagar is the old covenant from Mount Sinai. And the Bible says clearly that that covenant gives birth to bondage. Do you know the Ten Commandments are from Mount Sinai? Now, many people don't realize that God has moved mountains. They are still camped at the whole mountain. God has moved to Mount Zion a long time ago. And they are still camping at Mount Sinai. They are still preaching the law. You know, church, listen. Sin will have no dominion over you when you are not under law, but under grace. For the strength of sin is the law. So here, here we see two covenants. One gives birth to bondage, and the Bible is so clear. That's Hagar from Mount Sinai. Whereas the Bible tells us, uh, next verse, that this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free. Sarah, the mother of us all. That's grace. Amen. Now note this, these two brothers, they're actually half-brothers because they share the same father, Father Abraham, but they share different mothers. Are you with me? All right? Now the Bible says one, one, one of them, their mother is law, the, other, the other's mother is grace. Our biggest challenge will never come from people of the world. Our biggest challenges, church, will come from people who have the same heavenly father as us, but their mother is law. Our mother is grace. Are you listening? Yes. We share the same heavenly father, but they are fighting for the Lord. They are fighting for Mount Sinai. Whereas for us, we are, our mother is grace. Are you with me? And look at the, what, what the verse goes on to say. Next, drop down. Now, we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. The Bible says it very clearly that the one who is born of the flesh, the child of law, they share the same heavenly father, right, as us, but their mother is law. They are the ones persecuting those who are under grace. It is never the other way around. I said it's never the other way around. It's always the child whose mother is law persecuting the one whose mother is grace, even though we share the same heavenly father. Now, what is God's attitude towards them? Sit down with them, have coffee. Would you like to know what God's attitude is? The next verse tells us, what does the scripture say? What does the Bible say? Cast out the born woman and a son. Strong language. Cast out the old covenant of law. Cast it out. Cast out the born woman and her son. Wow. Wow. The way you cast out the devil, you cast out the old covenant, the Bible tells us. And look at this, for the son of the born woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. God is very clear. This word shall not is a double negative in the Greek, which means there's no way someone who is under law can inherit God's promise. Did you hear that? There's no way someone who is under law will become an heir with the person under grace. So with this in mind, I want you to smile at your neighbor and say, are you my brother or are you a brother from another mother? <laughs> All right? Are you my brother or are you a brother from another mother? You see, we share the same heavenly father, but there are those who advocate the law 
and the law brings a veil. All right, the law brings a veil, and you can't, you're not able to see the Lord because of the veil. You know, every time the, the minister says, unveil the bride, listen, you better unveil the bride. Because Jacob learned his lesson a long time ago. All right, Jacob, whose name is also Israel, all right, he married the wrong girl. He had two wives, and the Bible tells us their names are Leah and Rachel. Look up here. It says about Leah and Rachel, Leah had weak eyes, whatever that means. <laughs> Something was wrong with her eyes. Cross-eyed, whatever it is, but I think it's more towards being short-sighted. Now, that's very interesting because the Bible says Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Now, it tells us very clearly that Wendy is lovely in form and beautiful here. All right, so, what did I say? Did I say something? All right, anyway. <laughs> Leah had weak eyes. Scoring points. Okay. If you look carefully the typology of these two women, Leah represents the law. The law makes you weary. That's why when Jesus came, he looked at people and he said to them who were under law, he told them, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden. They were laboring under the law to please God. And he tells them, all who are weary, come to me. It's not because they were laboring in the farm or as fishermen. It's not that. It was, they were laboring to please God under the law. And he said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. So Leah represents weakness, all right, that comes from the law. Rachel, grace is beautiful. Say grace. Grace, grace is beautiful, all right? It's so beautiful, charisma. That's the word for grace gifts, charis, charisma, grace. Even the world wants grace. Do you know that uh, even a heathen king wanted Sarah, all right, because Sarah represents grace, amen? But they don't want to have it by faith through Abraham. They want to have charisma without faith. You cannot have it that way. Charisma is only for those who are of Abrahamic faith. Amen. Can I have a good amen? So both Joseph and Benjamin came from Rachel. By the way, Leah, her name means weary, all right, in Hebrew. Rachel, her name means ewe lamb, female lamb. Whenever the Bible talks about female lamb, that's subjective truth about Jesus as the lamb of God. Male lamb is objective truth, okay? Now, in order to bring forth Benjamin, the lamb had to die. Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. So watch this now. Before Rachel gave birth to Joseph, her first son, before Benjamin, Jacob had 10 sons. Where did they come from? They came from Leah and all the born servants. Notice that the law, Leah, and the bond women, they represent the law. They produce 10 sons for Jacob. 10, 10. Number of the law, the Ten Commandments. Okay? The moment Rachel gave birth to Joseph, the moment Jesus came on the scene, the other born women and Leah stopped bearing. Why? Because once Jesus is here, the law is fulfilled. Are you listening, people? All right? But she did give birth to Benjamin. Hallelujah. Rachel gave birth to Benjamin. So you can say that Benjamin and Joseph both share not just the same father, but the same mother. Whereas the rest of the 10 sons of Jacob, they had the same father as Joseph and Benjamin, but not the same mother. Are you listening? Now, let's look at the story of Rachel giving birth uh, to Benjamin. As the soul was departing, she called his name Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin or Benjamin, son of my right hand. Hallelujah. There you see the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he came, he went through the passion, the sufferings for us. He was the son of my sorrow. But that God raised him on, on the third day from the dead as the son of my right hand. The right hand is the place of favor, the place of authority and power. The place of righteousness. Isaiah says it like this, God will uphold you with the right hand of his righteousness. Can I have a good amen? amen? And righteousness is a gift. Amen? So, likewise, for the Benjamin generation, just know this. You might go through a period where you, people, the church will call you the son of sorrow. You're such a bane to the church. But don't forget, your future is son of my right hand. It is never from Benjamin to Benoni. It's from Benoni to Benjamin. <laughs> Your future is bright. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And notice that it was the mother that called him Ben-Oni. 
but it was the father that called him Benjamin. Do you know of all the sons of Jacob? Every son of Jacob was named by the, father, by the mother. Every, one of, every last one of them was named by the mother. The mother that can picture, be a picture of Israel or the church. The church has been naming the generations all these 2,000 years. They will say this, the Elijah generation. You have heard about the Davidic generation. Probably all of us have heard about the Joshua generation. But let me tell you this. Finally, the father says, enough of the church naming. This time, I will name the last generation. Wow. And he calls it the Benjamin generation. It's a grace generation. It's a generation that has a mother who is called Grace, who died giving birth to this generation. Hallelujah! You are the Benjamin generation. So for a long time, Joseph was in the palace. Amen. And now the seven years of plenty has come to an end. It's now the seven years of famine. And Joseph opened up the granaries for all the people that came to buy grain. And lo and behold, he saw his brothers. They came to buy grain. All right. Joseph, look at them. Now, they, they didn't recognize Joseph with his Johnny Depp, you know, eye shadow and Pirates of the Caribbean, Egyptian look. Amen? Mine is all natural. <laughs> From studying into the wee hours of the night. All right? But, you know, he had this royal regalia, so he looked different. They didn't recognize him. And he saw his brothers. The Bible said he had to set, aside, set, set himself aside to cry for a while and then came back again looking royal. And he said this to them, you're all spies. Say, we're not spies? Yes, you are spies. And the way you're going to prove to me you're not a spy is because you told me you have a younger brother, and that's Benjamin. Bring him here. All right? So Joseph says, bring your youngest to me, or else there'll be no more bread. Well, it took them a long time to finish off the grain that they brought back from Egypt until finally Jacob says, hey, you boys, the grain is run out. All right, why don't you go back to uh, Egypt and get more grain? And, 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 and they said, there ain't no way we can go back. The guy says he wants Benjamin. He wants uh, the youngest brother to go. And the father says, no way. Benjamin will leave me. I've lost Joseph. And I can't afford to lose Benjamin. So they waited a while more until truly, you know, the stomach has amazing ways to make you think different. And famine was severe. And, and finally, Jacob, old Jacob says, let Benjamin go. But please keep an eye on him. Take care of him. Let me just say this to you. When the Father looks down upon all the church that is in the world today, there's something about the grace generation that has a special place in his heart. Do you understand? Amen? I mean, there's something about the Benjamin generation, and you are that generation. Praise God. Now, I want to tell you something. As an insurance, Joseph told them, go back and bring your brother, and just an insurance, I'm going to keep one of your brothers with me. Who, who was that brother? Simeon. All right? He took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. You know what Simeon means in Hebrew? Hearing. So for 2,000 years, ever since the rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's hearing is locked. It seems like you can tell them the gospel and they're not able to hear. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, you, you tell them the good news and you're wondering, this is good news, man. You're no longer under law, you're under grace. And they're like, blink, blink. The Bible says blindness has happened to them. All right? Hearing, their hearing is locked. And Simeon will not be released until Benjamin comes. Are you listening? All right? The hearing will not be released for Israel until the Benjamin generation is here. Because the only message will touch them finally is grace. We're going to have more preachers telling them about the law. They know better than any of us about the law. They need grace. All right, so Simeon is kept as an insurance. He was locked up. It's very interesting that, how many of you know the story of the passion began in the garden, right? Jesus uh, sweat blood uh, to redeem us from the curse of human sweat that the first Adam brought us under, amen? And the first area he redeemed us was from the curse of human sweat, all right? So what happened was that uh, during the passion, from the time that Jesus suffered until he died and, and he was raised from the dead, did he do any miracles during this time? Not a single miracle, right, that we know of, except something happened in the garden. We know that Jesus suffered as a man. He's 100% God, 100% man, but he suffered as a man, as only a man can suffer. 
But he did only one miracle. You know what miracle was it? The healing of the right ear of the high priest's servant. Remember the story in the garden? All right, the, the, the servants came to arrest Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And here came Malchus, the high priest's servant, to arrest Jesus. And Peter took out a sword. How in the world this guy had a sword? He had a sword, all right? Oh, Peter had a sword. And Peter wasn't going for his ear. Peter was going for his neck. That chap ducked. And the Bible says his ear was sliced off, all right? Now, it's very interesting that his name is mentioned by the Holy Spirit in the Bible because names carry meanings in the Bible, all right? His name, Malchus, is the Greek version of Melech in Hebrew. His name literally means king or kingdom, Melech. My Jewish friend is here, so he knows Melech is king or kingdom. In other words, the year of the kingdom was removed the moment Jesus was captured. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus healed the year and restored the hearing of Malchus, the kingdom. In other words, in his passion, he paid for Israel to hear again. Now, why was it that Peter was the one that wielded the sword? Because Peter's name in stone. The Ten Commandments was engraved on stones. So the, the law always has a sword. When you don't obey, judgment comes. You don't obey, judgment comes. All well and good if you obey all the law. You, can, you must obey all. You cannot just obey the best as you can, the most of it, you must obey all. It stands as a composite whole. You break one, you're guilty of all, the Bible says. So the, the law is always wielding judgment. And Peter, stone, is wielding the sword. Are you listening? But Jesus restores the hearing of Israel. It's all paid for. Can I have a good amen? All right, so they, they uh, are now in this situation where the grain has run out, the food has run out, and Jacob says, all right, all right, take Benjamin with you, but please make sure nothing happens to Benjamin. So Benjamin comes before Joseph. Now, this is the first time he has seen his brother after all these years. What a touching scene. And the Bible says the moment he laid eyes on Benjamin, you know what he said? Look at this. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, by the way, the steward is unnamed. In the entire story of Joseph, the steward of his house is not named. Do you know why? Because he's a picture of the Holy Spirit. He has not come to draw attention to himself. He has come to glorify Jesus. He has come to take the things of Christ and expound it to us. Amen? So what does Jesus tell the Holy Spirit when the Benjamin generation comes before him? Prepare this man, bring them to my house, slaughter an animal. Listen, when the Benjamin generation stands before Jesus, they won't just get bread, they get solid meat. Amen. Slaughter an animal. Are you listening? They came for bread, they got meat. Isn't it like God to always over answer our prayers? Isn't it like God to always, uh, you know, uh, exceed our expectations? Yep. Yeah. Some parents came to bring uh, their children to be blessed by the Lord. He embraced them. He always exceeds our expectations. Amen. 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 I asked God for a companion. He gave me Wendy. <laughs> and she's a babe. So, <laughs> they came expecting to be bound in prison. Instead, they got a feast. They thought they would be bound, but they were welcome to a feast because Benjamin has come. You know, I believe the Benjamin generation came on the scene in the 90s. When God first gave me this message, it was in the 90s. And the Lord said to me, all right, son, you're going to prepare the Benjamin generation. I didn't know completely what it all was. I knew about the Joshua generation, but I didn't hear about the Benjamin generation, so I had to study. And right then there, Israel elected its first prime minister, youngest prime minister ever. His name was Benjamin yeah. Netanyahu. At the same time, Great Britain had the youngest prime minister. His name was Tony Blair. All this was in the 90s. And then US had the youngest prime uh, president then, Bill Clinton. So all three were, were, were world leaders at the same time. And the Lord says, just in the natural Israel, so spiritually. All right, the young generation, the last generation is already here. Amen. The Benjamin generation. And then, 
what happened was that in the 90s, we went through the whole thing, and it seems like grace was, was, was cast out. You know, we were called like literally the sons of my sorrow, those who are born after the flesh, persecute those who are born after the spirit. Amen. Constant, you know, in, in those days, they throw stones. Nowadays, they block. <laughs> they email. All right? It's the same deal. But the thing is that always the Ishmaelites are persecuting the true Isaacs, those born of grace. All right? But then, all of a sudden, somewhere in the two, this, this century, this past century, the 2000, God says, son, it's already here. It's gaining momentum. There's a whole generation that has experienced the gospel revolution. They're a grace generation. And all the naysayers, their voices are getting softer and softer, and a whole new voice is in the land. Hallelujah. A whole new sound, the sound of grace, the sound of victory, the sound of redemption. Hallelujah. And once again, Benjamin Netanyahu is prime minister. For such a time as this, it's almost like God saying, all right, this time, all right, it won't just be preparation. I'm launching Benjamin forth. He will no more just be in the Father's house. I'm launching him forth. There'll be no bread until Benjamin stands before me. Amen. Then, when he saw Benjamin, he was so touched by Benjamin, he says, solid meat. Give them solid meat. Solid meat. Now, that's the reason why we are seeing so much in Scripture now, because we are seeing solid food. The Bible says, he that, is he that is unskillful in the word of righteousness is only a baby in Hebrews. In other words, there are believers, even college professors, sometimes who will say things like, we need more righteousness in our life. Now, folks, righteousness is a gift. You cannot have more of it. You had all of it when you were born again. Yeah, are you listening? All right, you can have more holiness, but you cannot have more righteousness. Okay, so they are unskillful in the word of righteousness, for they are babes, the Bible tells us, but solid meat is here, because Benjamin is here. Amen. Amen. And then the Bible tells us, he sends them back, all right, to the father, and then he says this to them, by the way, the brother said this to the steward of the house, the Holy Spirit, all right, he, he said that, we found this treasure, we found money in our sex, and we didn't put the money there, look at what they said. They say that uh, we do not know who put our money in our sex. Keep that statement in mind. You see, the Jewish people today, many of them who are achievers, many of them who are, who are blessed financially even, all right, around the world. Have you noticed that the more orthodox a Jew is, all right, it seems like he's got a problem with poverty. But the more liberal they are, the more undeserving they are, the more the grace of God through Abraham touches them. Now, I'm not approving of their lifestyle. Let's put that aside first. Let's talk about the more orthodox, the more under law they are, it looks like the grace of God cannot penetrate. But when they are secular, when they are totally undeserving, the grace of God through Abraham, their father, touches them. So the, the, the Jewish testimony today is, we do not know who put the money in our sex. Are you listening? If you interview Zuckerberg, he says, I do not know who put the idea in my head. You see, the Lord, Facebook came out of because the Lord will make his face shine upon you. Okay? It's in the, in the Abrahamic blessing. So Zuckerberg never knew what hit him. Amen? He does not know who put the treasure in his sack. The Holy Spirit answered, the steward of the house answered, Shalom be with you, don't be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sex. It is God who has given Zuckerberg that treasure of the idea of the Facebook. It is God who put treasure in their sex. Amen. Do you know that one in five Nobel Prize laureates are Jewish? Do you know that? One in five, they are a minority race, and yet one in five Nobel Prize laureates are Jewish. Not bad for a minority race. Look at some of these accomplishments up here. Michael Dell of Dell Computers, only some, okay? Benjamin of Compaq, Intel, Oracle. Next, Jewish brands. Ladies, look up here, only some, okay? We, we only can show you some, all right? Next. We have Jews in the movie industry who started Universal Studios, MGM, Paramount, Warner Brothers. Next, only some of them, all right? Look at this, CBS, NBC, 
ABC, ESPN. Next, some famous Jewish actors. Next, in science and medicine, even the word medicine was coined by a Jewish guy. All right? It's not because they are so smart that this treasure is in them. I sat down with a Jewish ambassador a number of years ago, and he told me that, you know, I think the, the reason why Jewish people are achievers is because we have to survive, he said. But I know of many, many people who are survivors, and yet they're not as creative. No, it is in your covenant. It's in your blood from Abraham. You have a disproportionate influence for good or for evil, but it's a disproportionate influence. And you know what, church? Look up here. We have it because we are in Abraham's seed. We are in Christ. Hallelujah. The same anointing is on us. But why is it we don't see it? Because like the Orthodox Jews, we are trying to earn what God has freely given. We are trying to earn by the law, by our obedience, what God has freely given by grace through His Son. And as long as we are trying to merit it, grace cannot flow because grace is unmerited favor. Hmm. So go back again to what they said. We do not know who put our money in our sex. Okay? And then they, all, they were all welcome to the noon luncheon. And he set them all according to their birth. So they were shocked when, when Joseph did that to the servant. And uh, the Bible tells us, look up here, at the provision, uh, what Joseph said to Benjamin. The first word of Joseph to Benjamin locates that generation. The Bible says he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. Oh, I love that. I said his mother's son. Finally, Jesus looks down for a generation that has the same mother, and he has found it, at least in New Creation Church, and many around the world. Hallelujah, whole new generation. Samuel Smudja in Israel being persecuted for preaching grace. <laughs> but he's a, an example of entire generation God is raising. Benjamin generation doesn't mean young in age, all right? Of course, many of them are young in age. They're the last generation. It can also mean if you're 70 years old, but your mother is grace, you are the Benjamin generation. Amen. Amen. And look at this. The first word of Joseph to his brother after all these years, he said to his brother, God be gracious to you, my son. Grace locates that generation. Are you listening? God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother, so Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. He didn't have that same reaction the way, you know, his, his brother Benjamin had on him. I believe Jesus, not only the father, Jesus' heart is yearning for a grace generation that will represent him well before a world that thinks God is sending the tsunami, God is judging the earth, God is doing this. No, no, my friend. God sent Jesus. There was a time under the old covenant where God would judge because of they are under law. And God had to, you know, operate by the law because they asked for the law. They wanted to be under law. And even then, Elijah would call fire down from heaven. There was a time under law. It was right to do that. But under grace, when Jesus came, John says, Lord, shall we call fire and burn these people who just rejected you? The Lord turned and says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. And there are many, many people who want to be in the Elijah generation who has forgotten Jesus brought grace. What was proper and right at a given time is no longer valid. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. We are no more under the Elijah calling fire spirit. We are under the spirit of grace. And he just turned his back on the rejection and went to the next village. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, praise God. Now, watch this. He made them all sit down. He gave them food. And this is what Benjamin received. He took servings and gave Benjamin serving. Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. Five times as much. And he was a young kid. All right, he was probably a, a teenager at that time. And he has five times more food than all his older brothers. Let me tell you this. In these last days, God will serve you. Benjamin generation, God will serve you five times more food 
both in the natural and the spiritual. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Five is the number of grace. In, in numerics, five is the number of grace. The fifth time Noah's name was mentioned, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The fifth time Ruth's name was mentioned in the Bible, Ruth found grace in the eyes of Boaz. The fifth time David's name was mentioned in 1 Samuel, David found favor. Are you listening? Five is the number of grace. The entire temple of God, the tabernacle of Moses, are all multiples of five. Amen. Benjamin had five times more food. And not only that, look at this. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. Amen. Benjamin had five changes of clothing, folks. Amen. Number of grace, plenty to eat, plenty to wear. Amen. In the last days, all this happened during the time of famine. Yeah. It's during the time of famine. But the Benjamin generation have five times more. More food, more clothing. Amen. Amen. Food for the guys, clothing for the girls. No, no, <laughs> let's take both. Amen. Now, don't just think of physical food. Think of both natural and spiritual. Five times more food, five, time, five changes of anointing. I used to think that either you're a full-time pastor or you're a full-time businessman, but the Benjamin generation will have people who have an anointing. At one moment, they are pastors. Another moment, they are businessmen. Another moment, they are managers. Another moment, they are authors. It's going to be five changes of anointing for the Benjamin generation. It's all there. Praise the Lord. Five, the number of grace. Amen. Amen. Five times more food, five times more clothing. That reminds me of what Jesus says. Take no thought for your life what you shall what you shall. He's waiting for the Benjamin generation. Amen. And by the way, the 300 pieces of silver, Benjamin received 300 pieces of silver. Silver is redemption in the Bible. 300 is a number of victory. Gideon had too many people with him, and God says, you need less, because or else the people will boast and say that it was their arm that brought them the victory. So God narrowed down to 300. And with the 300, they conquered thousands. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. En Enoch walked with God for 300 years. All right? The woman who broke the alabaster box over Jesus, the disciple says, this should be sold for 300 penny worth. Amen. Number of victory. Victory of what? Victory of silver. Victory of redemption. The Benjamin generation will have the victory of redemption. Amen. So long, we say we are redeemed, but where is the victory? We're going to have it. 300 full of it. Yes. Amen? Yes. What's the message we have? Don't forget the silver cup. The silver cup of Benjamin was hidden in Benjamin's sack. You still remember that? In Benjamin's sack, the steward kept the silver cup. And why is it silver? Because silver is the metal for redemption. Gold is the metal for divinity. And notice it's empty. You know why it's empty? Because Jesus drank the cup of abomination, sin, and filth, and wickedness, and judgment. He drank it to his very last dregs. And today our, our message to the world is no more judgment, no more wrath from God, no more punishment. Jesus finished it all. It's the message for the Benjamin generation. It was found in his sight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. No more. No more judgment, no more punishment, no more wrath. Amen. In fact, I love the way the Bible says it. Joseph said it like this, put it in the mouth, in the mouth of the sect of the youngest. You know where we're going to proclaim this? In our mouth. Our bodies is our sect. We have this treasure in this earthen sect, and it's the mouth. You see, when you come to the Lord's table, remember this. Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the sending away of the sins. What happens is that when people come to the communion today, they, re they are conscious of their sins. They are sin conscious. That's the opposite of what Jesus said about a silver cup. 
He says, this is a reminder your sins have been sent away and you are to eat it in Eucharistic spirit, in thanksgiving. Instead, people are drinking it fearfully. Are you listening? They are partaking unworthily. To partake worthily is to say, Lord, I thank you. Your blood was shed for the remission of my sins. And you drink it. That honors the Lord. But to have sin consciousness and confess and confess and confess, that's unworthy of the cup. It's not a place of reminder of sins. It's a place of a reminder of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me, what I've done for you. No more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah! Amen. Let me just finish this. A message like this. Anyway, we're introducing the world to our kind of preaching. Let's come to the end of it. And it says, whoever the cup is found, with whoever is found, shall be my slave. And all the brothers say, no. No, Joseph, no. And you know who stood up? Judah. Judah stood up and Judah says, no. I promise my father I'll bring the boy back safely. And he says this, you know what? You can kill me. Why not let me take his place? He says, Joseph, you are like Pharaoh. You stand in Pharaoh's place. We are at your mercy, but please, we cannot afford to see our father weep the way he wept when he lost his first brother. And all of a sudden, Joseph looked at them and said, they have changed. They are now fighting for their half-brother, which they never did with him. Israel in the end times was because of the Benjamin generation, Israel would stand up and see Joseph face to face. Because of the Benjamin generation, the Benjamin generation, the message of grace, the message of this empty silver cup will cause Israel to stand up. You know who stands up? Judah from where we get juice. The word juice is from Judah. It was Judah who said, why don't we sell him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver? It was Judas, whose name means Judah, who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And it was the Jews who would say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, we welcome the Messiah, and he will come and save them. And in the, you know what, Joseph, he wept. He realized finally, they see it, and he wept. He says, come near, come near to me. I am Joseph, your brother. And they were afraid at first. He said, come near, come near to me. Isn't it amazing? We are so slow to learn this lesson. The very one who put away our sins won us near. He won us near. Like the woman at the well, he's, in essence, he's telling her, come near. I know you have had five husbands, but come near. You need my love. You need the live, living water. Come near. And by saying, come near, he set them free from every anxiety of the present because they just heard him say, I am Joseph, your brother. And they wept. And then he set them free from the guilt of the past by saying, don't be angry with yourself that you sold me here. With all the power he had, he used it to forgive. Jesus uses all the power he has to bless, to heal, to forgive. What about us? Do we use the authority God gives us to forgive? Or we demand our last penny? And he forgave his brothers, set them free. Be not grief of yourself that you sold me here. He set them free from the guilt of the past. And then he says, come near to me, dwell in the land of Goshen. Say Goshen. We'll close with this. Goshen in Hebrew means drawing near. And he says, there. Say there. There, there in that place of nearness to me, I'll provide for you and your little ones and your households. He set them free from every fear of the future. Let's, let's be found in that place of Goshen. Let's be found in the place of nearness. And let's make sure that we are not like the other brothers, but we are part of the Benjamin generation with plenty to eat and plenty to wear and plenty to give thanks for. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed all across this place and everywhere that's watching this. 
Perhaps you're saying, I want to be part of that Benjamin generation. My friends, this is not just a story. These stories literally happen, but God has orchestrated all these events in such a way to give us lessons in these end times. They have happened as examples, as types for us to learn from. Are you part of that generation? Or are you like the people of the world running around scared? Like a chicken whose head got decapitated, not knowing where you're going. Life is oozing out of you. Life is just blah for you. But my friend, isn't it wonderful that you have tuned in to hear what God wants you to hear, His prophetic word today? You need not be like the people of the world. Jesus is calling out to you, saying to you, come to me. Don't come to a church, don't come to a man, come to Jesus. Jesus said, come unto me, me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, shalom, true rest for your conscience. It happens in your conscience first because it's the knowledge of every sin forgiven, past, present, and future. And then it affects your emotions and your mind. And then it affects your health in your body. If that is you, wherever you're watching this, you say, Pastor, I want to be part of this Benjamin generation. I want to know when Jesus comes again, the heavenly Joseph, I am ready for him, that I'll be part of that Benjamin generation. Pray for me. If that is you, just pray this prayer right now, wherever you're watching this. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for me, for sending Jesus Christ to die on that cross for my sins. Thank you, Father. There's no more judgment, never ever again, hanging over my head. No more condemnation. I thank you, Father. Jesus bought it all, and I'm set free to be your child your loved child, your favored child, your blessed child, blessed with five times more food and clothing. Thank you, Father. Jesus Christ is my Lord. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Give Him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.